so hello friends now we are here coming to the topics of the today's seminar and i'll start with my topic which is basically introducing the subject to all the listeners among whom we have some students also so i'll handle those basic issues so that we have a solid foundation on which we can talk about the more advanced issues now here we have dr terry dr t l terry he was the person who actually could differentiate rob from a better known disease which is red uh, persistent primary hyperplastic vitreous and he found out that this syndrome is different with comparison to phpv in terms that it is more frequently found in premature and uh, underweight neonates and it is usually seen few months after the birth and it is usually bilateral which is we these features are absent when it comes to the phpv which is a very similar disease now it was also noted way back in 1950s that probably the oxygen has a role to play and this was established by few studies which i'll just mention here the role of oxygen supplementation in causation of rop was established by studies done in 1952 and 1951 and then later on it was also established that not only the oxygen supplementation but weaning away from oxygen also plays a role and then there was a study done in a lab which proved that yes both these issues are important and supplementary oxygen which is unregulated and then rapid weaning off from the oxygen to room air may be a cause for causing this rop but as time has progressed few other causative factors have also emerged now we had epidemics in rop and we had defined that first epidemic which was in late 1940s and 1950s when these premature infants who were weak and then the hospital were given unregulated and unmonitored oxygen supplementation and then we had a second decade epidemic again in the developing developed developed countries due to increase in the survival of premature and weak babies and now we are here with the third epidemic which is in developing countries like india and is characterized by a severe rop in bigger and premature babies which are relatively bigger as compared to what the trend has been so we are in this scenario that we are having a third pandemic which we have to deal with now just to touch upon how do we classify the rop so it's very easy to remember although it is little complex but i'll just try to make it as simple as possible so here we have stage 1 rop and stage 1 is like a line so it has a single dimension as i am showing it here and then you have stage 2 rop which becomes a ridge so ridge has two dimension so just like in comparison the single line a thin line with one dimension and a second line which is thicker this is stage 2 and then we have stage 3 where you have a fibrovascular frond so from one dimension the proliferative tissue changes to two dimension and it changes to three dimension when it starts rising up in form of a fibrovascular frond so it's easy to remember stage 1 is one dimension two dimension and three dimension when it comes to stage 4 we have a detachment right? because of this fibrovascular proliferation the tissue gets dragged and you can have retinal detachment if it is not involving macula that is 4a it is involves the macula it's 4b and then once we have advanced disease and we have total retinal detachment this is the picture where you have whole of the retina which is detached and disc is not visible because it is closed and obscured by the detached retina so this is the staging of the disease but it becomes little more complex because retina is a extensive structure and we should understand that the vasculature the immature vasculature which is 
the issue in this retinopathy grows from the optic disc and because it is growing from the optic disc it it grows centrifugally from center towards the periphery and so the disease may get arrested or the vasculature which is normal get arrest gets arrested at a point and you have a disease in particular zone when measured from the disc so we have zones divided into three parts that is zone 1 which is center central area centered at the optic disc and the radius of this circle will be twice the distance between the disc and the macula so this distance and then twice this will fame form the radius for this circle which is defined as zone 1 then we have zone 2 zone 2 is again a circle which is centered at the optic disc and it is touching the nasal periphery and because we all know that because the nasal optic disc is placed slightly nasal in the whole of the retinal configuration so we'll have a temporal crescent which forms a zone 3 and as we can see the growing blood vessels that start from the optic disc and they progress towards the periphery they get arrested at a point and so that we have zones which will define that if it is the disease has started in a central zone it is much worse because the rest of the retina is not vascularized and if it is started in a peripheral zone the disease is mild so this is added and in addition we have few more issues but we are not going to that detail i just touch upon what are the consequences of rop now it can cause a life long irreversible blindness in a child and that's a big burden and even if there is useful vision with ocular morbidities that the child can have morbidities like myopia anisometropia macular traction and these children are predisposed to have retinal detachment in future as the they grow and because of this these issues related to vision the child can also develop strabismus and amblyopia now as a child grows because of this lack of vision lack of proper refraction the child has a poor cognitive cognitive development and overall the poor physical and social development due to above mentioned issues because a child cannot see properly he has he lacks behind in every issue in the development process the education the physical work the activity everything is compromised now we have a disease which cannot be seen otherwise till we are looking for it because the subjects who are sus experiencing the disease cannot express the complaints these are neonates they just don't have any clue they can't speak and then there is a mismatch between the onset of the disease the optimum time of management and irreversible damage if it goes in a phase where the damage is too much so there is a mismatch so it has to be detected at a very right point and we also have definable risk factors which can identify the vulnerable population and we have a very robust and reliable screening tool that is fundus evaluation although it has its own limitations but we can depend on it so this is a disease which is a ideal candidate which needs screening process now risk factors which have been defined properly and i have incorporated that publication here as a qr code those who are interested that in this publication can go ahead and but overall these are premature children and which are born at a gestational age of 34 weeks or less or if they have some risk factors which have been defined here and or that is even if they have this independent risk factor of weight less than 2000 grams or combined with a prematurity these two are independent risk factors and these children should be screened for rop and if they have any other issue which is important from the point of view of neonatologist or pediatrician then again we have to consider taking these children for screening when and how so it has been a consensus that force four weeks post natal or 28 weeks post gestational age whichever is earlier and the screening has to be done in the nicu for a sick child or in a place where resuscitation 
methods and instruments are available maybe in a opd room with a indirect ophthalmoscopy with a 28 or 30 diopter lens with a dilated pupil and preferably with a speculum plus minus scleral indentation again this is a publication which we all can scan and go ahead and have full copy of that for our use now we at kgmu have been screening this for rop for last 12 years and for the last 3 years we have this data and we have screened for about more than 1000 patients in per year here at kgmu and that comes to something like 100 patients in a month and we have a fairly uh, good fairly i would say a uh, favorable incidence of rop that we have just 6.47% of rop total patients which are who are screened and i think that is a good score because that is at par with the uh, rest of the places in the world we'll be dealing with these issues of rop management and as we'll proceed further talks will deal about these as designated in the talk of other speakers now what i see is that rop screening is a significant stress for the neonate and it is also very difficult for the ophthalmologist because i have been training my students for that and i could see that there is there are issues and it's not a easy job so not only this is a stress for the child but only 10% of those who have who are screened have rop or are needing any treatment just as shown you in my data and we have 6.7% of neonates who need have rop and need treatment so we need to have safer and dependent alternatives as are needed now and there are few more parameters which are non invasive and patient friendly which have been developed with time which aid in is identifying the neonates who have rop or may need rop screening at preference so low weight gain proportion this has been defined as a independent factor win rop algorithm rop score and these are all available for use so that we can screen less children and expose them to less stress then we have tele screening using paramedical staff this can be done with using a red cam and in lucknow we have Uh, a hospital dr arthi will be speaking on uh, that hospital behalf and yeah they practice this kind of screening program where a paramedical staff goes to the periphery and he provides the images to the doctor sitting in the center and so that the efficiency of the doctor is increased with a reliable images coming to the doctor so i'm just wrap up my talk take home messages are that rop is a recently discovered disease when compared to rest of the diseases which are prevalent and it is seen exclusively in newborns with lifelong consequences affecting vision and hence physical and mental development of the child and treatable rop can only be detected by active screening of the babies at risk because if a particular window period has been passed away then the disease becomes untreatable or the prognosis becomes very very poor the risk factors are primarily prematurity low birth weight and a sick neonate sick neonate indicate includes rest of the finer points which were mentioned earlier slides and this disease is very much in agreement with the term that prevention is better than cure so screening is the only way we can reduce the blindness burden caused by this disease incidence of rop in india is going to increase as it is predicted as a third epidemic because the survival of these low weight children and premature children is improving now so we'll have that as a definable population and the scope of research presently lies in detecting robust and patient friendly biomarkers to identify the possibility of disease and a disease modifying treatment for normal development of the retinal vasculature now that finishes my talk and now we will have now i'll pass on the mic to professor mala kumar and she will talk on need and feasibility of rop screening and a kgmu and a neonatologist's per per view 
So welcome, Dr. Mala Kumar. Thank she you. Is, she is a professor in pediatrics in our department and in charge of NICU for quite some time. And she has been very instrumental in developing this particular unit in our university. And I think it is her passion to look after these very, very young children. Dr. Mala Kumar, please. Thank you, Sanji, for your very kind words. And it gives me great pleasure to be invited here in this uh, webinar where you have such prestigious uh, speakers. And I'm going to talk to you all about need and feasibility for ROP screening, a neonatologist's perspective. If we were to look at the number of babies that are born globally, we would see that around 135 million babies are born every year globally. And of these, 20%, that is 27 million babies are born in India. Of the babies that are born globally, 15 million are preterm. And a quarter of these preterm babies are born in India. So that means that in India, we have a big share of preterm babies. Now, because of this boom in uh, the birth of uh, preterm babies, low birth weight babies, so many sick babies, uh, the government of India has established a number of sick newborn care units. These sick newborn care units are almost state-of-the-art units. They have come up with the help of the National Health Mission. And these are units which are 12 to 20 bedded. They have around four doctors and 10 to 12 nurses that work 24 by seven. These units are placed in government medical colleges and in district hospitals all over the country. They cater to sick, low birth weight and premature neonates. Now, with the institutional deliveries increasing exponentially in our country, largely because of the Janni Shishu Suraksha Karikram launched in 2011, wherein mothers are given, women are given, pregnant women are given incentives to deliver babies institutionally. So when more babies are born in institutions, then more of these babies, if they need admission, if they need care, they get admitted into the essence use. And to top it, the government has now provided free transport 24 by 7 through a very well-developed call center system. So babies are born in hospitals and babies can be transported quickly from any uh, place of delivery, whether private or government, to a sick newborn care unit. So with this, the number of SNCUs that have been coming up in our country has increased exponentially. From 2008, when there were only 18 sick newborn care units in the country, to 2019, where there were more than 800 sick newborn care units in India. If you were to look at this map of India, you would see that the red regions are the ones that have got an increased density of these sick newborn care units. This little graph on the right, the map of Uttar Pradesh, shows that we have 87 such sick newborn care units in our state. And you will be surprised to know that in Lucknow, we have five such units. And uh, our unit at KGMU is one of these sick newborn care units, which has been um, set up by the, with the help of the NHF. So as the number of essence use is increasing, so the number of admissions in these essence use is increasing. And now in 2019, more than 1 million babies have been admitted, are admitted in the essence use every year, which is a big, big number. So it makes us very happy that there are so many essence use, there are so many babies who are coming there, they're getting treated and they go home. There is a very well-structured follow-up system also for these SNCUs where follow-up can be done at home, where the ASHA worker goes to the patient's home and visits the babies. She has to give uh, six visits in the first six weeks after the baby is discharged from the 
SNCU and the babies are also called to the SNCU for follow up and uh, they are scheduled such five visits in the first year. There is a very robust monitoring system of follow up also. Each SNCU has a data entry operator. The business of this data entry operator is to apprise the CMO of all the babies that are being discharged from the unit. The CMO then sends alerts to the ASHA worker in the area of the discharged patients and this ASHA worker can then facilitate home visits for the baby. The data entry operator also uh, sends SMS alerts directly to the mothers reminding them of the dates of follow-up. These dates of follow-up also include dates for ROP follow-up. So it seems that all is very good. Numbers are increasing. More babies are being treated in these SNCUs. But what about the quality of care? Quality of care is wanting. If we talk in respect to ROP, we find that pre-delivery antenatal steroids, which have a potential role in decreasing ROP, are often missed. Oxygen delivery is free for all, in the delivery room or in the SNCU. There is hardly any monitoring of this uh, of oxygen that is given to babies. And you'll be surprised to know that uh, most of the times, 60% of the times, babies in SNCUs are hyperoxic rather than being normooxic or hypooxemic. So that is, we all know, a very uh, potent factor give, which gives rise to retinopathy. Uh, it's a risk factor for retinopathy of prematurity. Infection prevention also uh, is not perfect in these SNCUs. Attention to the nutrition and weight gain of babies is also not looked at as it should be. Blood transfusions are often given without any real indications. And temperature maintenance, for example, uh, with kangaroo mother care is often neglected. So all these things which increase the incidence of ROP are not given due attention because of the workload. So quality of care is indeed sadly wanting. So on the one end, institutional deliveries are increasing. It is something to be happy about. Numbers of SNCUs are increasing. Mortality of newborns is therefore decreasing. But quality of care in these newborn care units is wanting. It's not good. And morbidity of these uh, newborn babies who are graduates from these SNCUs is also increasing. And follow-up is also wanting. All this will give rise to more ROP. And therefore, the importance of screening is underscored. So as many as 490 infants are born with a gestational age less than 32 weeks in India. Out of these, 5,000 preterm infants require treatment for ROP every year, which would really need so many qualified ophthalmologists to take care of these babies to prevent blindness. So keeping all this in mind, the government of India in 2013 included ROP screening program under the RBSK program, the Rashtriya Bal Suraksha Karikram. KGMU data of 2019-20 showed that 20% of the babies that were screened that last year had ROP and 13% uh, of these needed treatment. Four needed laser treatment, one was given anti-VEGF. These statistics are not some things to be very proud of. And we found that the risk factors were birth weight less than 1250 grams, gestational age of less than 30 weeks, oxygen therapy and delayed attainment all of full enteral feeds by these babies in our unit. So the challenges in controlling ROP in India, I feel are lack of awareness of ROP even in caregivers, increasing number of infants to be screened as we've already seen and more mature and heavier babies in India like in other middle-income countries, developing ROP. Inadequately trained manpower for screening and treating ROP and a lack of quality neonatal care. 
So ROP screening and its feasibility. Now ROP screening should ideally be in-house. That means that wherever the babies are being taken care of, ROP screening, the first screening must be done there. That is comfortable in the comfort of an SNCU and later on follow-up screenings can be done in an OPD. So uh, increasing awareness of occurrence of ROP and better utilization of the existing systems will help in a long, in a big way in screening babies for ROP and treating them. So tra uh, training of district hospital ophthalmologists and technicians. You know, these SNCUs are there in the compound of the di uh, district hospitals. And there are so many ophthalmologists working in the district hospital. Yet, none of them or many of them are not trained in ROP. So they do not give ROP screening facilities or treatment facilities in their SNCUs. Then there are these district early intervention centers, which are uh, have been set up by the RBSK. They have an optometrist in their uh, center. And these optometrists are really underutilized. They can do much more for uh, prevention of retinopathy or uh, prematurity. Then uh, mobile teams can be set up, which can go to the peripheries, to the rural SNCUs to detect ROP, screen ROP, and then properly refer them to centers that have uh, the facilities. Then uh, I feel that a hub and spoke model for providing a facility for screening and treatment of ROP is going to work for us. Herein, we have uh, at the center, the experts, the ophthalmology experts, the people who know how to treat these babies who have ret retinopathy of prematurity. And they connect with a whole lot of SNCUs in rural and sub-rural areas. And uh, this can easily be done by uh, technicians being trained in using the red cam. They can take pictures of, these, uh, of the retina. They can screen the retina of these babies in the peripheral SNCUs. And they can even make decisions. They can decide whether the baby's retina is in the red zone or the orange zone or the green zone. And they can... Uh, even guide whether this uh, baby needs further care with the expert or he does when he needs uh, follow-up screening. So then this would decentralize things. So I think the hub and spoke model will work well uh, in our country. And to substantiate this, we have the Karnataka Internet Associated uh, Assisted Diagnosis of ROP project, what is known as KIDROP. Uh, Dr. Anand Vinikar is the one who is the principal coordinator for this project and this started as a pilot and now it is spread over the whole of uh, Karnataka almost and it more than 81 neonatal units are served by this project and uh, what initially started as a pilot project uh, later on collaborated with on a, a private public partnership uh, model with the NHM and the government of Karnataka has seen this project uh, really flourish all over the state and uh, has uh, immensely prevented babies from getting blind in uh, Karnataka. Uh, similar initiatives have also come up in other states and like in Tamil Nadu with the help of uh, another uh, uh, private sector uh, uh, facility, the Arvind Eye Care uh, System. And uh, in Kerala, in Haryana, in Punjab, in Himachal Pradesh, uh, where uh, the government has uh, the government and private agencies have collaborated together to have a real good uh, network, uh, which works on the hub and spoke model. Similarly, the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust initiative, which was a five-year uh, plan for uh, prevention of blindness in the Commonwealth countries uh, has helped in a big way. And uh, this has been uh, integrated, uh, their business is to improve the quality of neonatal care and to integrate ROP services into the government health system using the expertise in the government and non-government sector in four states of India in a sustainable and scalable manner. 22 ophthalmologists in government facilities were trained by them 
and uh, to treat uh, to screen babies for rop and nine of them to treat rop critical equipment was provided by them and many personnel were trained and oriented on rop this included obstetricians neonatal nurses midwives and ashas so it appears that if the government sector were to collaborate with the private sector that means a public private partnership is the answer to much of the prevention of blindness due to rop in our country so the way forward is to increase awareness of rop among pediatricians gynecologists and even the general public collaborate with the government state government and the nhm to create a hub and spoke model for us uttar pradesh for example we have more than 87 sick newborn care units and the ones in lucknow itself which is the capital of up five of them none of them except us has a system of screening in house screening and there is no structured way in which follow up for or initial screening of these babies can be done even in the capital of uttar pradesh we should encourage public private partnership and ensure that all post graduates training in of thalam of thalmology are specially trained in rop as they are being trained in kgmu training personnel in the use of red cam non medical people in the use of red cam and the utilization of telemedicine i think are the way forward for uh, screening and treating adequately all these needy babies to prevent blindness due to rop thank you so much thank you dr mala kumar and that was a excellent wrap up of a perspective from different from what our ophthalmologists would see the situation as and as we had had opportunity to mention dr anand s venikar twice in our preceding two talks and the study which you were mentioning kid rop and i had also mentioned one of the publications of dr anand venikar now we have him as a speaker here and i will request dr anand venikar who is head of the pediatric retina at narayan netralay bangalore to present his talk on the established mode of therapy and time tested mode of therapy of treatment of rop that is laser therapy for Uh, rupi which can be a blinding situation if it progresses unrelentless dr anand venikar please you can have your stage good evening everybody and at the outset i'd really like to thank dr sanjeev and the department of ophthalmology in kgmu for this opportunity i wish i was there in lucknow it's one of my favorite cities but i thought i'll dress up for the occasion um so i'm going to speak a little bit about uh, laser and it's not going to be Uh, it's going to be as practical as possible so i'm going to try not to uh, cite studies but just give you a case examples on uh, what we can learn from each case and how we can refine our treatment so as dr sanjeev mentioned it is currently the gold standard although uh, dr manish is going to cover anti vegf as well because it has a very good uh, high structural uh, favorable outcome more than 90 95% if chosen and done well will have a favorable outcome and uh, a majority of them will have 612 or better and so they will not have visual impairment of course it depends on how well they are corrected uh, for other outcomes including refractive and cvi now uh, which laser well uh, literature used to have a lot of diode laser um, many years ago dr dogra showed that uh, green laser can be used probably more effectively and it was compared and published more than a decade back in the bjo i think today uh, even the queens diamond jubilee trust since dr mala mentioned has supported the use of green laser because uh, retina uh, surgeons can also use it for their diabetic retinopathy projects so uh, this is something that is uh, less painful easily uh, done uh, more portable and has a much better life uh, anesthesia is something that i think all of us almost have been trained in india to do laser through uh, using topical anesthesia uh, even the nnf guidelines of 2020 suggested that it can be done and only if you require a general anesthesia is required so uh, what one can uh, do is also along with topical anesthesia use the sugar pellets uh, studies in from australia have shown that the ideal one was sucrose 24% uh, 
uh, rather hard to get uh, except in chemistry laboratories. So just the regular 10% dextrose that we see, uh, that we use currently in our NICUs is often more than enough. And it is used throughout the procedure. Now, since we're talking about a baby who's awake because it's topical anesthesia, one of the important things we neglect is how we wrap these babies. So I'm actually gonna quickly forward. So the, the first thing to understand is this cloth should be made of cotton or linen and not woolen or uh, synthetic because uh, firstly it traps heat. And the second thing is that uh, if it is very elastic, the baby keeps moving inside and uh, it doesn't serve any purpose. Also, one must remember a very large surface area of the baby is on the face. So except that part, which you obviously need to keep covered, everything else needs to be covered. And uh, we keep one foot out, as you can see why. We usually strap a pulse oximeter. And if, if this is done inside the NICU, which is the best place to do it, you also have uh, the nurse and the, uh, the neonatologist themselves monitoring the baby. So uh, the two hands and the two feet uh, are kept in different folds, especially the two hands. If they are put into the same fold, the baby tends to uh, be able to push it out and open out your folds. Now, uh, since we are talking about this, of course, the laser is done with the surgeon standing. The ideal height is to have the baby's nose, uh, once the baby is supine, about one palm width from your umbilicus. So you are standing straight. It is the ergonomically best way to do the laser so that your back, back is spared for years. And also you get the best view so that you're not missing some of the anterior aspects, uh, which are often, uh, you know, you'll be able to see the posterior aspects, you'll see the aura, but the middle section is uh, what most uh, youngsters will miss because if you over depress, that's the portion that goes into the depression and you might end up under treating. So that is something that we have to keep in mind. Often we are asked how many spots of laser should we put? So we don't count, you just do a good job. The lasers for this is a montage picture, of course, of a red cam. But uh, the idea is to the spots should either almost touch or ha have half a burn width apart. So when they heal, they he heal with a syncytial scar. Uh, the idea is to treat all avascular areas, even if you find the ridge or the fibrovascular proliferation, let's say in six clock hours, make sure you've examined the entire retina. And in the nasal half, where maybe it does not have a ridge, you might still see avascular retina. And the point is one must laser that as well. Don't go home with the idea that you laser only anterior retina, anterior to the stage three or stage two with plus, but you have to also laser the avascular retina. Now we all encounter this tunica vasculosa lentis, which is uh, this kind of abnormal medusa head like uh, NVI like configuration, which sometimes makes the pupil very small. Of course, this can be an indication for anti-VEGF, but if you just spend about eight to 10 minutes, you know, using your depressor and going all around the eye, this pupil, because of just the mechanical stretching, it dilates. And as you can see in the picture below, and uh, you often have enough visualization to complete the laser. So let not that be the only reason for giving anti-VEGF. If there's some other reason, it's fine. But of course, literature has shown that that's one of the good uh, indications. Uh, this is, you know, sometimes the neonatologists are worried about a baby who is incubator dependent. You don't have to wait for the baby to become all right, because obviously ROP, uh, you know, happens in the most critical babies. So you want to be treating these babies, even if they are in the incubator. And as you can see in this video, even through the scratches, uh, you can, because laser is a coherent light source. And uh, as you can show here, Dr. Dogra's group showed from PJ many years ago, that you can treat this as long as the wall is slow. Now, uh, all of us will attempt to complete laser in one sitting. There are exceptions. Uh, one is the posterior laser, which I'm going to deal with towards the end. And the other one, more importantly, is the aggressive posterior ROP. Dr. Sanjeev covered that. So in, in AP ROP, uh, the flat new vessels, the flat neovascularization, you either, you have an option of either treating over the NVE and risk some small amount of petechial hemorrhages, or you laser up till the NVE, as you can see in figure 2a, and wait for the NVE to retract, and which then exposes the ischemic retina under that NVE, and then you go ahead and treat after about a week or 10 days. We've actually compared both methods uh, in a baby which had one eye in one method and the other eye in the other method. We found that the final outcome is the same. 
is just that the, if you treat the NV in the very first sitting, you have a slightly higher incidence of petechial hemorrhages, which can take up to four to six weeks uh, to regress. But eventually, the final outcome is the same. Here's an example of the two-staged one. So this boat-shaped NV that you see here, this has retracted, which was earlier sitting here. It has gone now more posteriorly, exposing this uh, ischemic uh, retina, which is underneath the NV. And you must go back and complete that uh, to get the best outcome. Now, the rest of my talk is going to be about seven or eight cases and what we can learn from each. So uh, laser in our center is still the preferred choice and we prefer it over anti-VEGF. This is a case of aggressive posterior ROP. Uh, our thumb rule really is that we do angiogram uh, using the RedCam3. If the fovea and the macula is perfused with capillaries, we still prefer uh, laser. It's more definitive. We have a better course of, uh, of the follow-up because as you can understand from our kit drop centers, we, have about, we are screening in about 127 centers across the state. Follow-up becomes an issue. So laser still is for us a definitive method. So here is a classical aggressive posterior ROP, ghosting of vessels, occluded vessels. But as you can see, uh, the macula is still perfused. And uh, which is seen here on the angiogram. And this is very severe capillary non-perfusion in zone one. So uh, what are we, uh, what am I trying to show from this case? That when the pupil is small and it's a little hard to make out where these uh, uh, markings are, what you can do is go around it once and mark out what is a safe posterior border, which means that in your mind, you don't want to be breaching this at least as of now. Uh, you don't want to be lasering suddenly on the macula because you can lose orientation when the avascular area is very large. Also, when you go around it like this, you tend to dilate the pupil as I just showed. Now, the other thing you can do is that you can mark out the aura serrata, especially if you're teaching a fellow or somebody else to do this, because sometimes the tendency is to laser even anterior to the aura into the parts which you don't want to do. So uh, you mark out the aura, you mark out the posterior, and then it's just a question of just filling in the two lines. So here it is, I'm gonna go a little fast. So once you cover the entire area, and of course you have to be very, very thorough and aggressive posterior, RP. Then you go back and you look at this eye and you decide, okay, can I go a little more posterior? So the thumb rule is be as aggressive as you can nasally, inferior and superiorly, only tend to spare a bit of the temporal retina because that's where the macula is. And uh, so here, for example, we didn't go any posterior than the last picture. A week later, you can see the plus has rapidly come down. The anger of the disease has come down. You now have only a small triangular avascular area here. Remember, if you had over-treated at the very first sitting, you would have probably gone halfway up to the fovea. So one has to be a little cautious here in under-treating just in the temporal aspect as long as your other parts are thorough. And then you can just fill in uh, a little bit where it's required and then they heal really well. These babies have more than now eight to 10 years of follow-up and they do extremely well. They do about six, nine plus. Some of them are six, seven and a half or even six, six parts. Of course, they've been corrected refractively uh, from the beginning. Here's another case. Look at this uh, very bad looking tunica vascular salentis. Almost looks like the uh, AC is flat. You know, it looks, at least it looks like that in this picture. And the media is quite hazy. You can look at this uh, and you can think, okay, I can give anti-VEGF. But in this case, clinically, already the fibrovascular proliferation is pretty raised. And our fear was, uh, is look at the superior aspects here. Our fear was that it will go into a crunch phenomena uh, if you give the anti-VEGF. So what did we choose to do? We chose to do laser. Again, you can see the temporal sparing. Everywhere else is a so-called thorough laser, which you don't want to have any skip areas. Now, post laser, immediately after post laser, this is the picture. And look what happens a week later. So now you have this vacant area, which you have deliberately left, but there's no other skip area everywhere. You must go back and examine. And of course, you want to put in only where it is required, this upper temporal, but not so much into the macula. Immediately after the supplement laser, the anger of the posterior vessels is quite evident, but don't panic. As long as you have done a thorough laser, just another 10 days later, this would be the appearance. So now the plus is completely gone, the ridge, the FNV, the CNP, all have gone, and then it starts healing. Many times we are asked, does the blood vessel grow over the lasered area? 
Indeed, it does. And we've shown angiograms where the blood vessels grow. But having said that, you must not ablate the ret retina with a very high power. And of course, we use green laser. Uh, I'm not quite certain that would grow into the laser bed if you're using a diode, because we've seen older cases where uh, you can only see choroid. Uh, I mean, you can only see sclera. The retina and the choroid is really blanched out. Right. Uh, this case, on the other hand, is an occluded case um, where there are capillaries are almost very deficient and up to the fovea not there. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time here because Manish is going to be talking about anti-VEGF. But uh, what I want to show you is this baby was treated with anti-VEGF. Uh, you can look in the top left to see the timeline. So one week later, two weeks later, but well, I'm going to skip many slides here to show you that even months later, now 10 months later, uh, you will still have an activity. So here is our problem. If you can't ensure follow-up, you might have even lost this eye. And we've seen many injected cases coming from other centers where they've assumed that the baby was fine because the blood vessels have reached zone two anterior and then follow-up is stopped. Now, when we do the angiogram, you can still see the active leakage. It's not very aggressive, but this is still active disease. So we use angiogram now to decide our posterior border of the laser, and then we complete the laser. And it's only then that we end up giving a definitive treatment. So this is before and after. Another case here, I just want to show you this one. Uh, again, the reason why we didn't give anti-VEGF here is because of the traction developing nasally. Uh, what I want to show you here is this is more like a hybrid case. In some areas you see a APROP and in some areas you see a stage. This is a very, we were lucky here. I think we were able to spare a lot of the macula. So again, we've stopped short here macula. We know that this is where the folds are. I mean, the U-turns of the blood vessels are. And sometimes you don't have to do anything more. This is one week later and many weeks later. In fact, this image made it to the cover of uh, the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology once uh, to show that sometimes you can spare a very large uh, area of the macula, but you're not always this lucky. You must go back and see if you need to fill in. Okay, so now these are pictures on the Neo camera. This is not the red cam, this is the Indian red cam. Uh, and I want to show you that despite a small pupil and a bad looking uh, uh, media, one can still complete the laser. So uh, here's uh, a little bit of the posterior laser. Again, you can see the traction developing, probably not an already uh, ideal case for anti-VEGF because of postmenstrual age was just being early, 35, but this was a rural baby. We had to go into the uh, district hospital to treat this baby. And you can see uh, after some, just two weeks, how the plus has come down, but you can see this uh, elevated uh, fibrovascular proliferation in some of the quadrants. What you need to go back and do here is more posterior lasers, a posterior to the ridge or the fibrovascular proliferation. You can aim to do that in the first shot, which is called primary sec uh, posterior, or you can go back and do it as a secondary posterior. And after you start doing the posterior laser, I'm just gonna switch to about uh, 45 postmenstrual age. So that was about 37. So another eight weeks after doing that, you see now a complete regression. You don't see any elevation, no fibrosis. The macula is spared. Everywhere else is healed well. The blood vessels are growing into the laser bed. So even that bad looking traction, especially inferiorly that you saw, can be dealt with. And even in the other eye, even in the other eye, uh, as I can show you, uh, the posterior lasers help. Look at this nasal picture here. This whitish thing uh, in, the, in the extreme of this nasal picture is actually the old fibrous caps uh, which are now become a vitreal membrane and they float away like a vitreous degeneration and you don't have any problems from there. This is a baby again given injection elsewhere and we manage with lasers. I'm gonna quickly skip on that. Another similar case, look at this bad looking uh, zone half or posterior zone one where the blood vessels have not even reached uh, the edge of the macula. And of course, vitreous heme, retinal heme, occluded vessels, obviously not a candidate for laser. So we've given the anti-VEGF and then had to laser accordingly. Now, sometimes you are confronted with cases that have been lasered by you or by someone else and it comes to you slightly older baby with still this active ridge. So this is the right eye, left eye, I've just uh, you know, superimposed just to show you. So at this point of time, you want to complete the laser where uh, there has been a skip perhaps, uh, and then also add this posterior laser. So the idea to show you this is, this is like a secondary posterior laser and uh, it gives you a wonderful outcome. It flattens completely. Of course, this uh, I needed some more laser in the interval. 
The other time you can use laser is to save time before you do a definitive lens pairing vitrectomy. So this is now uh, obviously a 4A. And what you can, what we are attempting to do here is we're doing posterior laser, much like a barrage and completing the laser. This was a case that was referred late uh, and was uh, in going in for surgery. What it ends up doing is, as you can see, in some cases that you might even you know, obviate the need for surgery. And in this case, for example, nasally, the traction just uh, literally went back. And that's because not all of it is traction. Some of it is exudation. And then you might even rethink uh, the decision to go back uh, and do the uh, surgery. Now, uh, just one more uh, example on this posterior fill-in. So as I showed you in these very bad aggressive posterior ROT cases, you've stopped quite far away uh, from the loops or the, the U-turns. And at this point of time, just immediately after laser, you don't really know uh, where the vascularization might end up. And just about 10 days later, you might end up, if you're lucky, uh, getting this ridge. So now you know that the vessels have reached up till here, actually except this flat NV here, and this is now the final uh, uh, avascular retina that you need to tackle. And if you just end up filling that, you get a wonderful outcome and you don't need to go any more posterior. Now, this was actually, uh, you know, the, the rough thumb rule of, of doing this posterior laser. And this was actually done way back in 2008, but now there are rules for posterior laser. So one wants to go up till the avulsion of the NVE. So even though this ridge is here, our current thumb rule is, if this is one disc diameter, all you need to do is one and a half times the width of this fibrosis. So if this is one, and one disc diameter, you want to go one and a half disc diameters posteriorly. Now, why did we go so posteriorly? Okay, so the first thing is that I'm not sure whether you can see it in this picture well, but there is avulsion. So the entire retina is lifted in a sort of a semi exudation semi translation all the way from here up to there. So if you don't go to the base of the avulsion, you're not going to be able to fill it in. I think you can see the avulsion better in this picture because of the contrast of some of the laser spots. Obviously, don't laser the blood vessels, but laser in between them. You will learn how to do it with just a little practice. And once you do that, it completely flattens out. You will get another opportunity of few days later and then you want to go back and fill it in and then it completely heals and that's what we want to show you here that if you persist and get rid of all this traction uh, you're going to have a fantastic outcome. I have about a minute left, so I'm going to quickly only end with this picture here. This is the uh, COVID-19 guidelines where the Indian ROP Society came out pretty early in March 2020. This was published online and has now been sent for peer review. Um, well, I'm only going to say that we all know when we want to treat. I'm not going to, I didn't get into that details there, but in COVID, since we are uncertain and of of course, the second wave is here. So I think this applies as much this year as last year, that we sometimes not sure that a baby who is almost going to require treatment next week, you know, can they come back for follow-up for all the reasons we know. So at that time, you know, if you can train your eyes on this fourth row here, less than type one, less than type one means ordinarily you would have waited for type one ROP to treat, but here you can treat stage two with three plus, stage three with no plus, and high risk for APROP. So this is somewhere you want to uh, treat a little bit earlier. This was of course overkill last year, where we had to do this in a COVID hospital, treating a baby with complete uh, PPE, but then uh, other colleagues have shared, uh, you don't need to go all the way there uh, and you can treat with just the amount of precaution that we've all been taking. So in summary, cover the avascular areas, plan APROP in stages, either naive or post anti vegf and posterior laser, either primary or secondary is what I wanted to show you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Dr. Aran, this was an excellent bouquet of cases and I must congratulate you and your patients who have, uh, you have been able to save their vision actually. I am sure that these patients, if they would not have been treated properly, they would have definitely ended up with irreversible blindness. And that also shows the kind of passion you have about what you are practicing. And I would give credit to you for that. And now let us move on to Dr. Manish Chandan, who is a senior consultant and director of Prayag Retinas Care at Prayagraj, that is prior Allahabad. And he will be talking on anti-VGF in ROP. Now, this is a newer modality for treatment of ROP and it has its own nuances. And he will talk about current indications and post-treatment protocol of management. Uh, Dr. Manish, please. Good evening. Good evening, all. Uh, 
first of all at the outset thanks to dr sanjeev and the entire department of ophthalmology kgmu for this opportunity actually anand has presented so well that it is looking like a cricket match to you in the like uh, the first team has batted so well it's a steep chase now so uh, anyhow i'll try to make my team uh, sound good so uh, everything we we start with everything is bilateral in the domain of thought and the ideas are binary janus was a myth of criticism and a symbol of genius similar to what we have in anti vegf it could be a boon when used judiciously but it could be a curse if not dealt with properly after that so this is the topic allotted to me anti vegf in rop current indications post treatment management protocols learning objectives are indications of the anti vegf as per the icrop and outside icrop understand the role of anti vegf treatment understand the side effects and possible complications related with the anti vegf and post treatment follow up and management protocol so with the increased number of premature births rop became a leading cause of uh, rop became a leading cause of blindness and where the vegf was having a very key role in pathogenesis for a long time the gold standard as suggested in etrop and we all believe that was lasers but it does not rule out a very poor outcome in more virulent forms of rop as i'm going to show you now so indications of the treatment indications of treatment are classical type 1 rop zone 1 stage 3 with without plus zone 1 any stage with plus zone 2 stage 3 plus now this when we talk of the standard trials which were which happened like the beat rop or the rainbow trial they showed equivalent results for posterior zone 2 but actually what i always believe is that they do not talk about the quality of life these neonates which we are treating are going to be young population young boys young girls and at that point of time if they have an handicap because of the laser which has been done and they do not have enough field of vision left so they will be curtailing so many of their activities including the sports including so many of their professions so i still believe that the anti vegf uh, these trials were looking at the anatomical outcome and not at the quality of life zone 3 stage 3 plus i believe that lasers are standard in this scenario now this to begin with now this is a case of aggressive posterior rop and this patient was injected anti vegf 6 weeks later you can see the vessels are growing beautifully not everybody is as great as uh, anand has done some beautiful lasers this was done at one of the premier centers you can see that uh, there is a significant amount of macular burn so this is where i get skeptical of the usage of lasers the other indications my team in madurai this paper uh, they published last year in gray phase and we were actually treating a lot of patients which were outside the international classification of rop so what are the indications repeat treatment the repeat treatment is like when we are treating or when i was deciding to treat a baby with anti vegf the entire idea was the future quality of life what the child should have and if the vessels have not grown much they have grown say posterior to uh, just anterior to the posterior zone 2 or somewhere intermediate then you again have to go and treat because the purpose of the anti vegf would get defeated very low birth weight babies and vessels in zone 2 intermediate or posterior i prefer to choose the word intermediate though it's not very standard term is somewhere in between the anterior and posterior uh, zone 2 which is very undefined it's a broad zone so these babies you don't want to risk uh, the pain of lasers or the duration of the lasers injections are very very quick as i'm going to show you in a video sick babies with unstable general condition it is very obvious hazy cornea cataract vitreous haze poorly dilating pupils these are for me a very clear cut indication where anti vegf should be tried when did anti vegf come into the fore this was the landmark trial the beat rop which all which gave us the confidence of the usage of the anti vegf the primary outcome here was the recurrence of rop which required retreatment it included 150 infants the results was in favor of the uh, bevacizumab group 
and they found that the significant treatment was uh, treatment success was found in zone one disease, but not for posterior zone two disease. These were again make uh, making very obvious. These were anatomical outcomes. So you can see beautifully done laser, similar patient injected, and the vessels have grown well. In conclusion. The superior uh, effect of the anti-VEGF like uh, bevacizumab was seen in in comparison to the conventional laser therapy for zone three stage three plus zone stage three plus for zone one, but not for zone two. The caveats of this study are never discussed, which I always find that the recurrences would have occurred after the primary endpoint, which which was not discussed. So lasers need a longer protocol, longer follow up. Rainbow trial. Uh, a very memorable trip. You can see Anand here and uh, Dr. Parag, Dr. Sarvanan. We all were there in uh, Berlin. So 225 infants were included. We compared the ranibizumab, 0.2 milligram, 0.1 milligram, and lasers. Primary endpoint was at 24 weeks. Conclusion was the 0.2 milligram of ranibizumab was twice as likely to achieve the success as compared to what lasers. So lasers were far superior they are almost uh, injections were far superior to laser uh, almost twice even 0.1 milligram the odds ratio was in favor of the injections by one and a half times so the advantages of anti vegf simplicity of injections this video was made when i was in madurai so you can see uh, you need certain basic instruments the injection is loaded there the child's identity is checked You put a proparacaine eye drop, maybe uh, the povidone iodine, and then you load the injection. Make it at that time we were using half the adult dose, which was the classical of beta rupi. After that, we reduced it further. The child is monitored well. I prefer to inject at one millimeter, one and a half millimeter, and this is done. So the effect, and you can check it. Similar thing can be done in the other eye. It has a rapid effect because next morning itself, you can find that the, uh, the plus disease starts regressing. Advantages, no loss of visual field. Continued normal retinal vascularization, which happens. So this is one of our cases in which you can see zone two, again, intermediate. There was uh, the laser which was done. And you can see that the laser has been done and a similar patient. Again, we had injected. You see the vessels have grown beautifully outside. So this, this patient would, when the child grows up, will not have much loss of field of view. Few more advantages. It can be used if cornea is opaque or cataractus, poorly dilating pupil. The advantage is lesser refractive errors in comparison to the lasers. This was shown in the cohort of the beta ROP trial. So more very high myopia was found in the received in the children who received laser treatment than in the eyes which received intravitreal bevacizumab. The problem with anti vegf now this is very important. What uh, I understand is that there is no defined endpoint of follow up. Once the babies are grown, then the EUA becomes difficult. Parents are nervous because each time you say you are going to sedate that child, the child is going to sleep. It's not a very feasible option if if you have your ROP OPD is very busy. If the parents become non-compliant, then these kind of complications, what we see, are a possibility. Fears with injection, end of thalmitis. Of course, it's plausible, but when I did a pardon by search, it revealed five papers. One was from uh, Dr. Parijat's group. So, not very common scenario. Concerns, the systemic effect of an antivitreal drug in preterm will not be similar to adults. The peak effect will, the half-life is almost 20 days. With uh, ramnibizumab, it will be about five to six days. The immature vessels have a, uh, in, infant has a small blood volume and the other organs may be affected when the blood retinal barrier is breached. The reduction of the systemic anti will have an implication. So this was a paper that again, Madurai, my team published in, we published this paper in uh, October, 2015, because we were trying to analyze whether actually there are neurodevelopmental uh, anomalies which are developing in the babies. And what we found was that the ROP, the 
severity of the rop and the zone that is lesser the zone zone 1 zone 2 these patients were having more neurodevelopmental delays and it was related to the degree of prematurity which is quite intuitive as well the children will have more perinatal issues with them so we did not find in this paper anything which was significantly related to the anti vegf usage it is more related to the prematurity and the perinatal complications which have happened and it was related to the zonal involvement now visual impairment in the rop also leads to the neurodevelopmental delay the child is unable to see well and that is the reason that the child may not develop fully see say the walking will be a bit delayed because the child is a bit uh, unable to see clearly now this was the canadian group which published and this paper there is a flip side to what we found they found that odds ratio of the neurodevelopmental disabilities and severe uh, cerebral palsy was almost 3.1 times higher in infants which were treated now mind you this study just like ours was a retrospective study but they have not considered the degree of prematurity in this paper they have not considered the zonal involvement so i mean both the studies should be taken with a bit of pinch of salt and we actually cannot be very certain whether anti vegf do really have uh, neurodevelopmental delays or not uh, unless we have a prospective study so the other complications reduced body weight gain choroidal thinning and rupture which has been reported from the lvp group tapas published this uh, paper which i found very interesting what happens in the phase uh, the rapid within a week rapid neutralization of the interventral anti vegf up to 11 weeks you have vegf secretion from the avascular retina and up to 16 weeks you can have a classic rop which can regress or it may progress reactivation of rop this paper uh, this was actually a case report but it was discussed very well when we were in uh, madurai and uh, in this a 24 weeker 630 gram had ap rop and was injected twice once at 34 weeks the vessel started growing and once at 51 weeks and till 80 weeks there was no recurrence so the child was lost to follow but at 2.5 that the child was 2 and a half years old the right eye developed fractional detachment and required two vitrectomies the left eye showed very significant uh, the peripheral avascular area which was later treated with lasers so injections one thing is sure are not one and done form of therapy so at madurai we never had such an issue that was a surprise to us because we were dealing with a, a decent number of patients so what we were doing was slightly a protocol which i had made and this was we were calling as injection with deferred laser now we'll come to uh, we we in this paper we had about 3792 patients screened of which these were the patients which were treated of very severe rop post injection we found that the mean time of recurrence was 6 to 8 weeks if the vessels reach the temporal aura as they do in 12 to 14 weeks we assume that retina is fully vascularized and the child is left to follow up in once in 6 months and later once a year treated babies with laser if there is no growth of vessels for con two consecutive visits now we called this injection with deferred laser protocol because we were treating where we were suspicious that the patients may drop out or these children may have a complication what we achieved with this parents after completion of treatment need to follow up at a longer intervals which also helped us in reducing our workload of the pediatric retina department the monetary burden on the patients was lessened of course that is very uh, understandable laser is definitely one and done if done properly there are lesser chances of uh, recurrence if it has been done the treating surgeon of course if you have injected you want the child to do well you don't want complication is more relaxed so the conclusion is aggressive posterior rop anti vegf may have a slightly edge over lasers in such situations as we have seen in some photographs safety concerns about the anti vegf on retinal vasculature uh, has to be discussed properly dosage still is not very well defined i had when i was in madurai i had come to about 0.1 uh, cc of injection and those children were also doing well actually so 
Treatment with anti VEGF is not a one and done therapy. ROP can recur late, and we can consider ablating the retina as per the injection with deferred laser protocol if retina is not well vascularized and the child is growing up. Repeat EUAs are to be avoided. This is exactly what we want a happy, beautiful child. Thank you so much for the time. Dr. Manish, that was excellent. And I would say that it was like sort of a debate between laser and anti vegf which was again an excellent situation because you see that both these treatments are actually meant to treat a similar stage of disease. And when we have two modalities, which is the indication would be common, you will always have this debate. And it was an excellent opportunity to see that one person who is going with the laser, another person going with the anti -vegf. And I think we should have them some sparking of some process uh, regarding this issue. And now I will move on to the, the, I would say the star speaker here, Dr. Parijat, who will talk about the difficult and most difficult part of managing this particular disease, that is the surgery, which most of us would fear of performing in these children and because of the difficulty and a very guarded prognosis. And Dr. Parija Chandra is a professor of ophthalmology in RB Center in Ames. And Dr. Parija Chandra, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. So I'm very grateful to you for <laughs> inviting me for this webinar. And uh, I'm also very thankful to KGMU for uh, giving this opportunity to uh, talk with your audience. So I'll be talking about surgical management of ROP. So uh, whenever surgery uh, is started, we need to be aware that there are a lot of challenges involved in surgery. You need a very strong anesthesia team. Otherwise, you can have, you know, hours just spent, you know, looking for a vein. So you need an experienced team to do this. You need a lot of challenges have to be done interoperatively because it's a small eye. So you can end up with complications while operating. There can be difficulties in instrument access, post-op bleeding, intra-op bleeding. So you need to be careful about uh, manipulating these very small eyes. And then there are a lot of post-operative challenges. You need a very strong and ICU backup because many of these children become sick when they go out from the GA and there should be a strong support system for clearance and post-op management of these babies. So when to operate, this is a common question which uh, many ROP uh, specialists ask. So we like to operate early. So let's see the situation. These are two photographs of the right eye and left eye. If you see the left photograph, the eye is already lasered and is going into stage four ROP. The traction is developing. If you see the photo on the right side, you again see that the traction is there and uh, hemorrhage is happening over the posterior pole from the ridge. So this is the right time to operate this case, maybe a little too late in the right eye. So this case was referred to us and we advised surgery, but unfortunately the child became sick and was unfit for surgery. And when he came back to us two weeks later, this is what he looked like. What I'm trying to show you here is that the prognosis has changed in two weeks. The ROP, which is progressive despite laser, tends to progress very fast and we should not be wasting time uh, as far as surgery is concerned. So we should go in as early as possible if we know that it's progressing despite laser or injection treatment. So what you will appreciate what has changed in the two photos above and the two photos below is now that the ridge has picked up more height, has become more peripheral in the right photo, has now also involved the macula, has become a well-defined structure, macula is also dragged in both the photos. So this is no longer an easy scenario which was there not only surgically but also prognosis-wise in this case. So what changes as you lose time is that the traction picks up more height, becomes more peripheral. So instrument access becomes difficult and therefore, you know, the surgical outcome might not be as good as you want it to be. It becomes more vascular and there's a higher chance you'll have intraoperative bleeding, you'll have postoperative bleeding. So again, better go in early. If the lens becomes involved, you might not be able to do a lens sparing surgery. If the macula becomes involved, then, you know, the outcome uh, as far as the vision is there is not as good as you want it to be. So how is the outcome with uh, stage four ROP surgery? So if you see this photo on the left side, you see this is how it came to us. It was a stage 4A. It was pretty advanced. This is again a late presentation. I'm trying to say that we need to operate even earlier than this. So if you see the outcome on the right side, it was as good as new and the entire edge disappears and it comes out very well. So you need to go and operate these cases early. This is the same photo I showed you earlier. Again, if you see this photo, uh, 
you will again see you know that uh, there is a problem here as far as the right photo is concerned because although the traction has gone, the blood has gone away, but the macular pucker still stays. So the prognosis is still not as good as you would have expected had you operated a case where the macula was not involved. So again, we should not let the macula get involved uh, and we should go in early. Sometimes the cases come like this. If you see just from the anterior view, just with the torch, you'll be able to appreciate that. The, the retina has come and stuck behind the lens in the periphery. So again, very difficult to do a lens sparing surgery in these cases. The right photo shows you that it's really come and stuck behind the lens. And if you try to insert your instruments through a lens sparing approach, this is going to go and go subretinal or touch the retina and create breaks. So again, you'll have to go through a clear coronal approach in this and the lens cannot be saved. So we should not wait and pray for the retina to uh, go to this stage. We should go in early and refer early. So to show you case 25G uh, lens sparing vitrectomy being done. This is typically how these cases of stage four appear. So this band is joining the disc to the peripheral TRD. So we want to release this traction. So that band we have released. Now we're doing uh, vitrectomy over the TRD to release the traction so that the vertical traction is relieved and this ridge can fall back later. So you see it's very vascular, it bleeds. And you see just where the cutter is now, the circumferential traction is there. So this is also we will relieve later. So this diathermy is being done over the ridge so that it doesn't bleed post-operatively. And you can see the vertical traction is relieved, the circumferential traction is now relieved. And we expect this ridge to fall back. Now the localized PVD is being done so that this all can fall back. This is another case scenario where again 25G vitrectomy is being done. Here you can see a more posterior kind of TRD is there in zone one. You can see the yellow vitreous is there. The glow is totally yellow. So once this traction is relieved on the top, then you can see these fresh laser marks we are given just prior to surgery under GA. So once you relieve all the traction there and the vitreous there, so now you see the pink red glow of the retina comes in, all the yellow vitreous is gone. You see the macula is also not vascularized and now PVD is being done and uh, you see it's so vascular. And this is how it looks like at end of four weeks. You can see the entire traction has gone back and the macula is vascularized and has gone into the periphery. So again, this is a very advanced stage of ROP and can go unpredictably and laser and uh, injection alone cannot deal with this. Surgery is needed in a timely manner. The outcome in this case was good, but it can be worse in this case as well and can proceed in an unpredictable manner. So it's better to uh, go at a stage where the outcome can be more predictable. This is another common scenario where if you see that uh, the eye has already been lasered, but in zone one, you see uh, the significant traction is developing and the extensive neovascularization, which you see. So in this case, if you do surgery alone, it's not going to help because with so much neovascularization, still is going to pucker up and close the retina. There's a high chance of intraoperative bleeds, high chance of postoperative bleeds. So we like to combine anti-VEGF with surgery in these cases, and this kind of outcome can be obtained at four weeks. So this is not possible if you don't give an anti-VEGF combined with surgery. And uh, surgery alone does not work in these cases. We have uh, found that anti-VEGF combined with surgery in the same sitting works very well in these cases. So we just inject anti-VEGF under air uh, through a, a, a green tip cannula. And uh, this is how it works. So many times the cases come which uh, both eyes are getting bad. So early we used to operate the worse eye and by the time we used to go for the second eye, the second eye used to become bad. So now we like to operate both the eyes together in the same sitting so that both eyes get a fighting chance uh, for a good early surgery. And we like to operate both the eyes in the same sitting. It's known as immediate sequential bilateral vitreal surgery, ISBVS. And both the surgeries uh, are done in the same sitting, although uh, all precautions have to be taken that these are independent surgeries. So after the first surgery, you know, the entire team re-scrubs, the bottle is changed, the instruments are changed to minimize the risk of infection. The parents are counseled that, you know, we are trying to do both the procedures in one step to, you know, to minimize exposure to GA because GA is a very high risk uh, situation in these babies. A 36 week old child going in for general anesthesia is a very high risk situation for the child. And we don't want to do multiple GAs for these babies. So uh, proper counseling is very important, not only for the risk of GA, but also for the risk of bilateral infection if it rarely can happen. So common complications which happen for beginners who start with surgery are these are small eyes. So you can end up, you know, touching the lens, touching the retina, which you see here. So a retinal break has happened just at an instrument entry. So you can just go ahead and laser it. And this, this is another common problem which newcomers encounter. It's a misdirection of the uh, infusion cannula and you can end up with super fluid. 
so again you have to avoid complications like this because very small eyes again very small eyes you see the instrument can go and touch the lens and can lead to cataract you can have intraoperative bleeds post operative bleeds so uh, these all have a learning curve and uh, uh, newcomers can learn how to manage these situations uh, by getting proper training in a surgical center so stage 5 rup is another ball game a lot of babies come to us with stage 5 rup it's very sad that around 5 babies to 10 babies come to rp center every week you know it's a very sad situation all these are preventable causes of blindness as dr gupta and dr kumar very nicely uh, elaborated the pediatric aspect and how what we can do for the screening of these babies so we really need to prevent um, you know blindness in these babies yet many of these babies come like this these babies have never been screened we do give a trial for surgery in some of these cases in the hope for getting navigable vision the outcome of surgery in these cases are universally poor but we do get like to give a trial because many of these babies do get some you know hand movement close to face some finger counting close to face they do see shadows so if they do see shadows you know then you know they can recognize the parent in sitting in front of them so the social smile comes the developmental milestones come the parents are happy you know that the child is smiling and seeing them although the child cannot clearly see the face of the parent they do see the shadows and that is you know very gratifying even that much comes and if they get navigable vision they can you know go from one room to another to the toilet they don't crash along the way so they become empowered and they're able to do much more than what just a pl plus minus child would be able to do and obviously every stage 5 baby is a potential medical legal case because they are all due to lack of screening the lack of a, Uh, screening in the system lack of screening lack of treatment leads to these babies to go into stage 5 rop so we can no longer ignore this fact because you know there are rop screening guidelines nationally internationally for decades now it's not a new disease it's a disease which is there for a long time india is having the largest number of preterm births in the world so this is a disease which cannot be ignored any more and we need to be aware that we need to screen these babies and treat these babies in time because stage 5 has poor prognosis and if you don't catch it in time Uh, is going to be a poor outcome. Just show you how I like to operate these cases. So this is a 23G MVR going in through which I like to put 25G instruments. It allows for a sutureless entry exit in these cases. So here you can see the lensectomy has been done, posterior signing gear released. So what I'm showing you here is a good prognosis case, possibly the best prognosis case which you can get. You can see there's just central fibrous tissue is there. The posterior signing gears have been removed, and you can see the opening has been created. It's got a 360 degree TRD all around. this funnel is open on ultrasound and uh, this is the best case scenario open open ultrasound configuration on usd and you can see all the tissues removed the disc is there the macula is attached the posterior pole is attached although it's not so healthy looking and it's got a 360 degree trd and you can go in and operate these cases and you know it comes out very nicely and this is what it looks at 4 weeks so this is not to say that stage 5 has a good outcome stage 5 universally has a very poor outcome rarely cases will get a good outcome like this with attached posterior pole but many cases which we operate do get navigable vision and that uh, changes the life of the baby so we do attempt a stage 5 rp surgery in a large number of these cases so i would just like to show last two slides to show good practices for referral as many of us might not be doing rp surgery and they'll possibly be referring them to higher centers uh, so just some good practices for referral for these babies So always send the baby with a pediatrician or ambulance for opinion. If you want to send to a, a, a neighboring center or a higher center, because a child sent alone will just get lost in a center. And if admitted in your place, better to provide pediatric support. Otherwise, the child may collapse while on the way or while on uh, roaming around the hospital. If you want to send a sick child, always send a trained medical support personnel. Many people like to send, you know, a trained technician or an intern. so these people are not able to handle a child which is collapsing needs intubation and needs some certain emergency support while he's waiting outside a doctor's area or while being traveled through an ambulance so it's always good to have a trained medical support personnel send up at least a post graduate pediatrician who is able to support a baby if he collapses on the way many people like to send you know that the hospital will just take a child for surgery so don't send a sick baby don't discharge and send a sick baby uh because we see so many of these babies just collapsing sitting at the doctor's table and they probably just are being rushed to a pediatric emergency setup and uh, you know it it just doesn't help the baby in any way the child becomes blue on the table so it's always best to send a trained support personnel with ambulance support don't discharge and send a sick baby because a sick baby 
will not reach a GAOT for stage five or stage four surgery. He will reach a pediatric emergency care, and uh, most probably will be referred back. So it's better to send a stable baby. Send always all the relevant papers of referral, so that a clear chain of events can be traced. And in nowadays scenario, always best to send with a COVID status, a COVID positive baby in a non-COVID hospital will again not reach uh, an ophthalmologist. So it's very important to know that you don't send a COVID positive baby or an untested baby to a non-COVID hospital because he will need a COVID facility before surgery. He will need COVID testing before surgery, and it will just waste valuable time. Send with all the current investigations again. Uh, most of these babies, which I see, find you know at least 40, 50 percent babies turn up with low HB, although they appear to be absolutely stable and normal. Usually HB is six, HB is seven. So we need to understand that general anesthesia baby will not go for full surgical two, three hour surgery with a six or seven HB. So they almost stress for 9.5, 10 HB. So if you have an HB report which is six, seven, it's best to get a blood transfusion and send because the child will waste less time searching around different hospitals, trying to get a blood transfusion in an unknown city. And it becomes very stressful for the parents and for the child as well. So it's best to you know, send a stable baby who is fit. And if he's not fit, it's better to get it fit in the referring nursery because there they can do it much faster in known circumstances, in known team setups. And otherwise, in a, uh, if you send them across to a bigger city in an unknown hospital and in a place where you know mostly uh, eye center will be standalone, they will anyway need pediatric care in any other place. So you know, it's always best to send a, a stable baby and take care of all these things or make the baby stable and send and not waste too much time because the child needs early surgery. Just a quick word on if you have a huge surgical referral. So this is both for the pediatric teams as well as for the ophthalmology teams. If the collaboration which you have is generating huge surgical referral, as Dr. Kumar said, you know, we need to have good NICU practices. We need to talk to the neonatal unit because every baby which needs surgical care needs a huge effort from the ophthalmology teams, pediatric teams, anesthesia teams, lot of concern, lot of high risk procedures are needed for these babies. And once in a while, it's fine. But if you're generating a lot of surgical ROP, a lot of AP ROP in your, in your NICU, then you need to have a system in place. You need to partner with an ophthalmologist, create a regular screening program. Because if it's regularly happening, then you know a lot of babies might be missed and might end up with medical legal cases. Follow the ROP screening guidelines, which are now available, whom to screen, when to screen, good practice should be there. It's always best to learn the best NICU practices because NICU practices, if uh, followed in a good way, prevent ROP to a large extent. And we actually, if you see, the AIMS NICU does not generate surgical ROP. All the good NICUs do not generate surgical ROP at all. They generate very uh, less ROP, which needs treatment. So we need to understand that this is the key word, you know, if you have best NICU practices in NICU, surgical ROP does not develop. I have not seen any single baby for the last 20 years which is born in AIMS and ICU and which is referred to us for any kind of surgical care. I have not seen case of APR being referred from the AIMS and ICU for, for any kind of injections. So what I'm just trying to say is that if you have good and ICU care, uh, severe ROP occurs to a very less extent. And obviously you have a good ROP screening program in place. It will not happen. We need to make uh, people aware of the medical legal liability. So we need to screen in time. We need to treat in time. Surgical ROP, uh, if it reaches to that stage, you know, the outcomes become unpredictable. Laser and anti vegf outcomes are more predictable. So it's better to get it, a child to that stage where it can be dealt with an earlier and a simpler level of treatment. And obviously, if you have a surgical case, refer early for treatment, stabilize the child and refer for treatment. That will go a long way uh, to have a better prognosis for this baby in the end. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rajat, and I think it was very nice some of the hope as well as the situation which should not arise. I could see the, the cases which, you have, which have improved the surgery where like as far as my capability and my thinking is concerned, concerned I would say that they were impossible to treat, but they had a nice anatomical uh, outcome. As you have realized, this should not happen. And I fully agree with that. So let's move on and have the last talk of this. And we'll have now Dr. T. Ellens has been my postgraduate student and is in 
in our room. She is at Sam I Hospital now, and she'll be talking about the wrap up after everything has been. What to do next? That is post paro. What are we start? Uh, am I uh, audible and visible now? Yes, but you need to make your presentation full screen. Yes, is it all right now? Yes, ma'am, it is clear. Yes, go ahead. So, a very uh, good evening, and I'm really grateful and honored to be a part of this uh, webinar, especially organized by my alma mater. And we've come almost to the end of the session on uh, ROP, and we've had the most wonderful talks. Um, my talk is basically, basically on the post-treatment care of ROP babies from the point of view of a pediatric ophthalmologist. Now, there are many challenges that uh, these NICU graduates face. And after the initial storm of ROP is over, there still looms a danger of ROP sequelae, structural uh, sequelae. And apart from that, ocular morbidity in terms of refractive errors, trebismus, cataracts, etc. And in addition to this, we also have neurological impairments, which could affect vision in the form of CVI and neurodevelopmental delay, uh, cerebral palsy, et cetera. So when we are seeing these babies for an ROP follow-up in the pedi pediatric ophthal OPD, there are certain questions that we need to ask. Uh, is the baby developing normally? Does the baby have age-appropriate visual behavior? And here I would like to say that uh, it is not just the chronological age that is important, but also the corrected age. And what exactly is the corrected age? The corrected age is the age of the child calculated from the expected date of delivery rather than the actual uh, date of birth. Now, it is unfair to compare these babies to their uh, term counterparts just on the basis of their chronological age. Hence, we also look at their corrected age because they can lag behind in some of the developmental milestones. Uh, other than that, we also look at whether there's a squint, there's a stagmus, whether there's a significant refractive error. Why I say significant is because babies aren't born emetropes, and uh, we are bound to have a certain amount of hypermetropia and astigmatism when we are refracting a baby. So we need to know if the, it is significant enough to be uh, prescribed. Now, uh, we come to the visual development and milestones of a baby and why is it important to know this? Because at least uh, we can have a qualitative assessment of how a baby's vision is developing. Why I say qualitative is because often it is not very easy to do a quantitative assessment of the visual acuity in these very young babies. And um, instruments such as the teller's acuity charts are not available um, very widely. So at least qualitatively, we'd be able to assess how the baby's vision is developing if we have a fair idea of how the baby's uh, developmental milestones are. For example, um, fixing follow and face regard at three months, trying to reach out and grab objects at six months, uh, pincer grasp at nine months, and so on. Coming to the ocular morbidity, now I want to stress here that it is not just ROP that can cause ocular morbidity and many of these conditions that are listed over here can actually occur just with prematurity by itself, uh, even without the occurrence of ROP. Probably refraction, uh, right after we uh, you know, check for their uh, visual development comes refraction and uh, it is not very easy for us as pediatric ophthalmologists to do it in very small babies. Now, why is it so very important? Because uh, prematurity and all of the problems after that, uh, ROP, um, ROP complications, all of these interrupt the process of emetropization with the result that uh, we see a lot of refractive errors in these babies and they can have an earlier onset, they can be much higher, and also they are more unpredictable uh, in their uh, progress. Now, I've put up these numbers because the sheer burden of refractive error is staggering. Uh, the proportion, these are just representative studies. And why I haven't put a comparison of uh, studies, because there are so many, is that irrespective of what kind of study we look at, whether it is uh, cryo-ROP, ETROP, beta-ROP, Indian studies, uh, Western studies, small babies, big babies, it doesn't matter because none of these studies have shown the refractive error to be in single digits. 
as opposed to um, you know population based studies or school based studies in which the refractive error is in single digits it's anywhere between 5 to 10% and as you can see here the amount of refractive error that we're looking at is humongous uh, whether it is myopia even high myopia more than 6 diopters in in more than 39% babies astigmatism and isometropia all of these are very very prevalent now i'm choosing myopia to talk about uh, especially because that is the one that is progressive and the one that we are more bothered about because uh, it has its own set of complications uh, especially with high myopia now myopia over here is multifactorial and it's not just the rop or the severity of rop it is also prematurity it is also the treatment modality um it is claimed that anti vegfs are uh, you know cause less amount of myopia but they are causing myopia and much more myopia than uh, is seen in the normal public so irrespective of what form of treatment the baby has got he still is at a very high risk of developing myopia now if you look at term babies uh, the axial elongation is the primary factor uh, responsible for the myopia but in preemies in addition to that we also have a, a steep cornea we have shallow ac and we have a thicker lens Now, if you just look at this uh, very simple yet uh, informative graph from the Community Eye Health Journal, there are a couple of things that come to notice. Uh, the blue line shows babies who have had no ROP but are premature. They have a low risk of myopia, and you will note that the myopia doesn't start off very early. It can start off by three years. Obviously, there are no hard and fast rules here. But on an average, they start off a little later. Babies who have had ROP but have not required treatment uh, have mild ROP do have a moderate risk of uh, myopia and these babies can also start to show their myopia quite early as you can see in this graph and usually they stabilize by the age of 2 to 3 years they plateau now children who have been treated for ROP are on the other hand at a very high risk of high myopia and as you can see they can uh, start off as early as 6 months and then can progress very very fast and uh, but they also tend to stabilize or plateau earlier on this is uh, in contrast to school going myopia or simple myopia which tends to occur more after 4 5 years of age now the last point on this slide is uh, query query role of low dose atropine now low dose atropine is very much in work for the treatment of simple myopia simple uh, and progressive myopia but there is not, nothing simple about the myopia that is associated with prematurity or rop so i don't think that in the near or immediate future we have enough evidence evidence to start using a low dose atropine for rop associated or prematurity associated myopia coming to prescribing glasses for these very young babies uh, it requires a lot of counseling even for our general pedophile uh, population prescribing glasses is difficult because of uh, still a certain significant amount of social stigma associated with it and uh, you can imagine the amount of uh, distress that it causes a parent a young parent to know that his very young baby who's not even sitting up or standing yet would need to wear glasses so it needs a lot of counseling and one needs to uh, be sure that we're using the appropriate cycloplegia age appropriate appropriate frame correction uh, selection and also very frequent re-refracting now there are guidelines of course for uh, prescribing glasses uh, basically anything over plus or minus 5 diopters cylindricals of more than 2.5 diopters and an isometropia of more than 1.5 diopters but what i want to stress here is that it's the visual behavior of the child that should govern the prescription of glasses because one can use a lower threshold for prescribing glasses if we think that the baby's vision is not developing appropriately uh, a quick word about appropriate frame selection uh, if you notice here in this uh, picture i've highlighted two things one is most babies have a flat nasal bridge so they need a silicon pad at the bridge of the nose to adjust the um, fit of the frame and you can see here for babies who are not yet sitting they cannot really wear regular frames with half temples so there are special pediatric frames which you know don't have temples which just have a band running across the head which are comfortable comfortable for babies and even if the baby is not sitting up they can still wear these glasses coming to strabismus another very very common uh, thing that we see in our rop follow up babies uh, just like with refractive error you can see that the population based uh, numbers are in single digits whereas in rop babies the incidences are much higher 14.7 and et rop 25% 36% these are very high numbers of strabismus 
and as opposed to term infants in whom uh, congenital or infantile esotropia is much uh, much more common we see a fair amount of both esotropia as well as exotropia in rop babies and uh, strabismus has a very strong association with prematurity periventricular leukomalacia poor uh, vision and also a high incidence in cerebral palsy they can also be pseudo squint with the macular drag as you can see in the picture uh, right at the bottom uh, challenging the management is challenging because it is often difficult to uh, measure and examine these babies and sometimes the outcomes the surgical outcomes can be poor especially in patients who have neurological uh, disabilities coming to amblyopia again a 10 times more uh, risk of having amblyopia in a premature baby versus 2% in the normal population and since refractive error in strabismus is so very common in rop uh, they are obviously the main culprits behind amblyopia but another thing that i uh, wanted to add here was something that i often see in practice during our uh, routine rop screenings we see a lot of babies with hemorrhages and i do make a point to uh, you know note when i'm first seeing a hemorrhage that is involving the macula and when i stop seeing it so that i know how long it has taken to uh, resolve and if it has stayed over the macula for a significant period of time then i know to counsel the patient that it can be amblyogenic Cataract and glaucoma are seen in approximately two percent uh, of ROP babies, according to various studies, and they can occur spontaneously or uh, following treatment. For example, cataracts, the iatrogenic uh, reasons, as we've already discussed earlier, inadvertent laser burns, lens injury during injections, or post VR surgeries. Now, if they're visually significant, they're treated as per the normal uh, pediatric cataract uh, norms, uh, except that they have a higher incidence of uh, retinal detachment associated with it. and even for glaucoma it has multiple uh, mechanisms uh, with which it uh, because of which it can happen but it's treated as per the usual pediatric glaucoma norms just a quick word about the rate ret uh, retinal sequelae which i think warrant almost a lifelong um, examination for these babies not just a recurrence and structural sequelae but sometimes peripheral uh, avascular uh, retina that is left behind can develop atrophic folds and detachment Now, no, I don't think any talk um, about ROP and its uh, aftercare is complete without a mention of uh, CVI. And this is, although it needs a whole session on itself, but CVI is what we suspect when we basically see that the eye is looking normal, but the baby is still not seen. So this is visual visual impairment because of uh, neurological uh, reasons. It could be mild to severe, and what we need to understand it. is that it is not just the visual acuity that could be impaired in cvi but also contrast color motion perception there can be visual perceptual disorders field effects and a whole uh, number of things associated with cvi and uh, we have low functioning high functioning cvis which means that a child could have near normal vision also but but still have uh, certain visual perceptual disorders uh, all under the gamut of cvi prematurity hie hypoglycemia seizures electrolyte imbalances all of these things are risk factors for cvi in premature babies and even term babies so these babies again because uh, examination is difficult in them objective assessment of the vision is often difficult they need a functional visit, uh, vision ass assessment to see what their strengths and weaknesses are and their retina and their other eye examination can be absolutely normal um, they may or may not have a refractive error their uh, nerves may look normal but they can also have uh, you know atrophic uh, optic nerves hypoplasia even pseudo pseudo glaucomatous uh, cupping uh, we often order neuroimaging for these babies and what we usually see um, is periventricular leukomalacia glaucosis atrophy cystic changes and all of these uh the care of rop babies is not complete without visual stimulation and rehabilitation because apart from cvi we also have babies who uh, end up in stage 4 stage 5 and despite wonderful uh, treatments uh, available they still may not have uh, a good functional uh, and visual outcome and for these babies it is important to have a robust uh, team for uh, the rehabilitation and this is a multi specialty approach here So you can see a few representative pictures of how uh, a dark room stimulation is being done for this baby on top um black and white patterns uh, light stimulation so basically what these children need as stimulation what they like to see is light 
uh, black and white patterns, red, yellow, shimmery, um, shimmery things. So all of these things can be used in simple ways to stimulate the, the vision of these children. And although at first it may seem to be non-rewarding, the patients have to be encouraged, the parents have to be encouraged to keep going at it. Now the suggested timings for follow-up, uh, I would like to stress here that it is a suggested uh, timing for follow-up because these are general guidelines, but they have to be really modified according to the individual patient's needs. And um, the injected babies need a much closer follow-up. Uh, refraction and visual behavior at each visit, visit can help us sort of customize the follow-up uh, duration. And this is what has been suggested uh, according to the Community Eye Health Journal. Uh, so if a baby, a preterm baby has no ROP and we are looking for refractive errors, the level of risk is low and probably the baby can be screened at two years of age and then annually thereafter. For a baby who's had ROP, but again, mild ROP, which did not require any treatment, uh, we are again looking for all the usual culprits, refractive errors, trapezoids, etc. But the level of risk is much higher. So they need to be screened earlier at at least a year of age and then annually thereafter. ROP treated with laser, we know laser or cryo or uh, anti vegf we know that the level of risk of any of these uh, things is high, very high. So we need to see these babies at least three monthly for uh, at least two years of age and then every six months till six years of age and annually thereafter. These are the suggested guidelines, but they can be absolutely tailor made according to each baby and depending on how their numbers, their uh, refraction is changing. Thank you and stay safe in these very uh, bad COVID times. Thank you, Arthi, and that was a very nice presentation. Summing up all those issues which come up once the parent and doctor, they both think that the storm is over. And I think that nicely wraps up all of the session and I would personally say that maza agya. And every one of us must be having the same experience. It was very nice to have all of you here. And I will again repeat my thing that we all have probably rarely met personally, but it was a very nice glowing and I think we all could convey something to our audience.